So this is uh, Book of Hebrews, The Glorious Jesus, lesson number five in the series, the title of this particular lesson, Jesus Greater Than Aaron, and this is the first part we're going to be talking about this subject, Jesus Greater Than Aaron, for a couple of, uh, a couple of sessions. Well, so far we have seen in the book of Hebrews, um, the writer of the book is encouraging Jewish Christians who are thinking of going back to Judaism. He's encouraging them to remain faithful to Jesus Christ, the author uh, of their faith and the author of um, their salvation. And as I mentioned, the uh, book of Hebrews divided into two parts. Uh, very simple to, uh, to uh, organize this book. Part one, the writer shows that the glory of Christ is greater than the glory of the Jewish religion and all of its parts. And then part two, um, oh, oh, I forgot to mention one thing. And, and in our lesson so far, we've covered three of these parts of the Jewish religion. Uh, the Jewish prophets, he showed Jesus greater than the Jewish prophets. Uh, we've looked at uh, the Jewish concept of angels and he's demonstrated Jesus greater than the angels. And uh, of course, Moses, uh, a very authoritative figure in the Jewish history, Jewish religion, he's demonstrated Jesus greater than Moses. In the second part of the book, he's going to talk about the glory of the church, the body of Christ, and what keeps it glorious. Okay, so those are, that's how the book is, is broken into two parts. So in this lesson, we're going to examine what the author says about the fourth part of the Jewish religion, and that is the priesthood, and especially the high priest himself. So uh, what we're going to look at is a very long passage where the writer is going to touch on three specific things. First of all, Jesus is a high priest and one who is greater than Aaron, the original high priest. Secondly, he will give his readers a rebuke and a warning concerning unfaithfulness. And he's going to tell them, don't abandon the superior high priest who is Jesus in order to go back to the old high priest. And then thirdly, he's going to explain that Jesus is a, a different kind of high priest. He's not like Aaron. He, he doesn't come from Aaron and he's not in the style of Aaron. He's in the style of a man or a priest called Melchizedek that we read about in the Old Testament. So tonight we're only going to touch on the first of these three ideas, Jesus greater than Aaron. Now in the previous section, the author was reminding his readers not to ignore the warnings contained in God's word concerning disobedience and disbelief. And he told them that because of this, because of disobedience and disbelief, Moses' followers had not entered their rest. Remember I said the, he uses different words sometimes to describe their reward. Their reward was the promised land, right? An actual physical place. Sometimes he called it the promised land, sometimes he called it the rest. But these words were simply referring to the same thing. And he says, be careful that you today don't disbelieve or disobey because you're going to end up like the Jews in the desert who died in the desert and never made it to the promised land or their rest. All right? And of course, the suggestion was that they were in danger of the same fate if they disbelieved and disobeyed their leader, Jesus, and would not enter their true promised land uh, which was heaven, not, well, not a geographical place, but a dimension, a spiritual dimension. So in verses 14 to 16, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, in chapter four, by the way, of Hebrews. So in verses 14 to 16, he kind of changes gears and he encourages them to renew their efforts to go forward towards this rest, this promise, because they have a helper who is already there awaiting them and helping them to enter in, and this is the key idea. You know, he's billboarding ahead of time what he's going to be talking about. So it's with this device that the author introduces the idea that Jesus is also a high priest, because this is a new idea now. He hasn't talked about this so far. So let's read verse 14. He says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
let us hold fast our confession. So he boldly makes his summary idea in one concise statement. Okay? He says, Christians, they have a high priest. They have a great high priest. Now, an interesting thing here, um, the Jews never, and the Bible never referred to the high priest, Aaron or anyone, as a great high priest, always a high priest. All right? But here he's referring to Jesus as a, a great high priest. The unspoken suggestion was that the Jewish religion was superior because uh, it had a priestly system. Priests who could go before God on behalf of the people to thank God, to ask God, to, to atone for sin, so on and so forth. So the author says to his readers, hey, wait a minute, the Jews, yeah, they have a high priest, Aaron, but we too, Christians, we also have a high priest. So that's the beginning of his argument. Secondly, he says that Christian's high priest is not on earth, he's in heaven. So you know, the idea is the Jewish priests, they're here on earth. Christians are represented in heaven appealing to God on behalf of uh, on behalf of the uh, people. Thirdly, he says, Jesus, he's that high priest. The one who's in heaven, that's Jesus. He's the Son of God and he serves as high priest for his people. And then fourthly, he says, the people should be encouraged by this fact, by this truth. I mean, if their high priest is already in heaven, well, then they need to maintain their faith. This is, you know, we, we have an assurance here. The Jews, they saw their high priest he was physical, he was, he was limited, he was sinful, he was just a man. So the writer is saying, but our high priest, he's in heaven already. We have a much better high priest, better chance of making it, okay? Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So even though Jesus, as the Son of God and high priest is in heaven with God, don't get the idea that he's so far away that he can't relate to us. He's saying this doesn't mean he can't relate to the problems of human suffering and failure. Just because I said he's in heaven doesn't mean he can't relate to us. He, as a man, was tested by Satan and by the limits of humanity. You know, he was hungry, he was tired, he was, he was chased from place to place. He was beaten, so on and so forth. So he suffered physical things. I'm not talking about a vision here. You know, I'm not talking about some spirit being. I'm talking about a real person, a real man. And, of course, he did not sin. Now, this will be an important point as we, as we go along. The suggestion is that in him, we have the perfect mediator, one who is already in heaven, making sacrifice, advocating on our behalf, and one who uh, can understand and sympathize with our weak nature. Uh, but at the same time, can stand boldly before God on man's behalf because he himself has no guilt, no shame, no condemnation account of sin because he's sinless. Remember the idea here. He's showing how Jesus is superior uh, than, uh, as a high priest than, than, um, than Aaron. Verse 16, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So since Jesus knows the power of sin, right? He was tempted, he was tested. Since he knows the weakness of men because he was fully human, he, he was hungry, he was tired and so on and so forth, he felt pain. And since he understands the mercy of God because he is God, because he has a divine nature, his followers should and can approach God with confidence. Don't be afraid, he's telling them. He has gone before them and prepared the way and now he tells them that if they come in his name, they will find mercy and they will find God's help when they need it. All right, so now we're going to go to chapter five. And and he's going to back up. Now he's talked about, in, in a general way, why Jesus is greater than the high priest. Now he's going to talk about Aaron specifically. So he continues this idea by introducing Aaron, Moses' brother, who was the very first high priest. Uh, if he's to make a comparison to Jesus, well, he's going to need to describe Aaron and who he was and, and what he did, all right? So originally, the ones who offered sacrifices 
uh, were not the priests, they were the head of the families. They were the ones that did the sacrifices, right? You know, Abraham, he was the head of the family. He, he was the patriarch. He offered sacrifice, and Isaac, and Jacob, and so on and so forth. Now the basic idea behind a sacrifice of any kind was that something was transferred from the physical realm to the spiritual realm through death or destruction. If you've ever wondered why, why death? You know, because that is the, that is the conduit, okay? That's the, that's the point where something goes from the physical to the, the spiritual uh, dimension. Death or destruction was the passageway from the physical world to the spiritual world. For example, for Adam and Eve, atonement for sin was transferred from them to God through what? Through the death of an animal. They sinned, they disobeyed God, they were uncovered. What, what happens? Well, an, an animal is killed and an animal's skin is used to cover them. So the very first death. Uh, Noah, for example, uh, he's, he's giving thanksgiving for safety through the flood. And, and how does he do that? He offers a sacrifice. He offers an animal, right? Genesis 8.20. Jacob, he makes a vow to have only God as his God. And that vow is transferred from the physical realm to the spiritual realm. How? He poured out a, vo a, a, vo a vial, excuse me, of oil on a pillar. In other words, he destroyed the oil. You, know, you couldn't use the oil any anymore. So a product, an animal, something was destroyed or burnt or, or killed in order to transfer one thing to go to one dimension to go to the other. So now when God gave the law to Moses, He also included a much more formalized system of sacrifices that contained specific instructions concerning the reasons, the times, the manner, and the materials that were to be used in the practice of sacrifices. And much of this information is contained in the book of Leviticus. And so um, the Jewish religious system, the Jewish religious system and worship was built around the activity of sacrificing to God a variety of animals and produce in order to express various things, in order to express or transfer from the physical to the spiritual different things. Sacrifices that express thanksgiving, you know? uh, sacrifices that express purification, atonement, blessing, so on and so forth. The transfer from one dimension to the other was always through death or through uh, destruction. In Leviticus chapter one verse, or chapters one to six, we read the instructions for the preparation of these sacrifices. You know, there were burnt offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, guilt offerings. So God provided uh, every detail from how to kill and prepare the animal, how to actually offer the sacrifices. The, the priests were even taught how to do the motion. You know, they had to, uh, some of them, they had to wave, you know, a wave offering. The wave had to, you know, they had to wave the animal or a part of the animal before God in the sacrificial uh, uh, ceremony. Um, um, they were taught the order in which it was to be presented and what other items were to accompany the sacrifice. Very detailed. It was complex, it was demanding, it was expensive, it was time consuming. I mean, some sacrifices had to be done every single day, every morning, every night, others on special occasions. In addition to this, the priests had to offer the sacrifices that the people brought to them as well. So not only the sacrifices for the feasts and so on and so forth, uh, people would bring sacrifices because they wanted to make a thank offering to God. Well, they couldn't just, you know, at the backyard barbecue, you know, kill an animal and make a thank. No, no, they had to go to the temple, go to the priest. Only the priests could offer the sacrifices on behalf of the people. Now, God also, not only a system, but He also appointed a specific person and family to carry on these tasks as well as a specific place where these things were to be done. In, in the desert, it was the tabernacle, right? That portable temple, if you wish. And then once 
uh, Jerusalem was settled, uh, then they built a temple where all of these sacrifices um, were to be made. Uh, and we read that Aaron, Moses' brother from the tribe of Levi, along with his sons, they were the first ones appointed by God to this role. Now, sacrificing would no longer be done by the heads of each family, but by a high priest on behalf of all the families. This is the change that took place when they were in the desert. Now, the important point to remember here is that this task or this ministry was only given to Aaron and his sons and their descendants. According to God's law, only the descendants of Aaron could serve as priests. This is why they call it the Aaronic priesthood, because it comes from Aaron. And people in his family, it wasn't enough that you would be from his family. There were also physical requirements, no blemishes, no broken bones, no scars, no rashes, nothing, no missing parts to the body. You know, so it was very, very stringent as to who could be the high priest. Now the high priest also had an elaborate rite of purification uh, and dress that we read about in Leviticus chapter eight. I want to read that passage. It says, then Moses had Aaron and his sons come near and wash them with water. He put the tunic on him and girded him with the sash and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him and he girded him with the artistic band of the ephod uh, with which he tied uh, it to him. He then placed the breast piece on him and in the breast piece he put the Urim and the Thummim. He also placed the turban on his head and on the turban at its front he placed the golden plate, the holy crown, just as the Lord had commanded uh, Moses. So let's go through uh, these, particular, um, these particular elements in the dress of the high priests here. First of all, there was the turban or the crown. He wore a turban made of linen with a blue laced ribbon which held a golden plate uh, on the turban in front with the words, holiness to the Lord. Okay, because he himself was holiness to the Lord. He had been set aside holiness to the Lord. This was a constant reminder of his separation and calling to serve God and the people. We read about that in Exodus 28, 36, 38. Next, the onyx stones. One stone on each shoulder, on the top of each shoulder, secured by a strap that served to hold the front and back of the checkered and embroidered ephod. Interestingly, the names of six tribes of Israel were engraved on each one of the stones. The names were placed on the stones in birth order. So the six the sixth oldest brothers were on the right shoulder, right stone, and the six youngest were on the left shoulder on the stone that was there. This meant that the high priest carried the names of the tribes before the Lord when ministering in their name, Exodus 26, 6 to 14. So always reminders, I mean, he was like a, advertising to remind what he was all about. He cared, you know how we say, you know, he has the weight of the world on his shoulders, you know, we, we use that expression. Yeah. Well, he had the weight of the people, the weight of the responsibility of the people as high priest. He had that on his shoulders and, and those onyx stones there represented that. There were braided chains. These were made of gold and along with ribbon were used to hold the breastplate in place. The breastplate had rings in each corner and the chains were attached from these to the shoulder plates that held the onyx stones. Again, Exodus 28, 14. The breastplate itself that they wore in front, this was actually a piece of elaborately finished cloth. It was the same material as the ephod. It wasn't a thing made out of metal. Uh, it was twice as long as it was wide, but it was folded over to form a square roughly nine inches you know, uh, wide and high. And because it was folded over and worn like this, there was a pocket here, okay, created a pocket. As I said, it had rings in each corner from which the chains and ribbons were attached to secure it into place. Now on the breastplate were fastened 12 precious stones. 
Uh, sardius, topaz, emerald, turquoise, sapphire, diamond, jacinth, agate, or agate, amethyst, beryl, onyx, and jasper. All of these 12 stones were set in gold, and on each stone was engraved the name of one of the tribes of Israel. Here the idea was that the people and their needs were always close to the high priest's heart and before the Lord constantly. So the responsibility was here, okay, represented on the shoulders, and emotionally the care for the, for the people was always on his heart. You know how we say, I have a burden on my heart? You know, well, he had the people, his burden was the people on his heart. Okay? Then we talked about the Urim and the Thummim. Uh, Urim means lights and Thummim means perfection. Uh, it's thought that these were precious gems placed inside the pocket of the breastplate. Now, not a lot is known about these, but since this was before the time of the prophets, it may be that the priests used these in some way to discern you know, a yes or a no from the Lord, a little bit like uh, dice, you know, not to play games or anything, but you know, if they turned one way, the answer was yes after prayer or no, like a lot that was thrown. Uh, Exodus 28, also Numbers 27, 21, talk about that. The ephod, an overgarment made of linen with gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, it was like a tunic. Uh, it was woven, it had a front and back panel, and it was held together by the gold clasps on the shoulders that had onyx stones. Again, Exodus 28. Uh, the sash, sometimes the girdle, called a girdle uh, or the sash. Um, uh, this is what held the ephod in place, and it was securely tied. Now when the high priest was girded or sashed, it meant he was fully clothed in all of his high priestly garments. It was made of golden threads as well as blue, purple, and scarlet linen. Um, the colors are significant because in that day and time, people did not wear colors. Only royalty had colors because it was very difficult to make colors in those days. Uh, the robe was worn under the ephod it was a plain blue sleeveless garment reinforced at the neck and it extended below the ephod. Again, Exodus 28. There were bells, I think the picture's a little too small there, but there were, there were bells sewn on the hem which could be uh, heard as the priest moved about. These were made as, uh, of gold. As the priest moved about inside the temple, inside the tabernacle, and especially on the Day of Atonement, when he went inside the Holy of Holies, no one else could go there. So as he moved about you know, doing his duties there, you could hear him. You know? The idea was what happens if he dies or you know, he's struck or something like that. So they could hear him as he was uh, doing his work and also assuring the people that the Lord was uh, accepting the sacrifices that he was making on behalf of the people. Also pomegranates, a row of pomegranates, not real ones, but you know, uh, a type of uh, something that had been uh, created, um, were embroidered on the hem of the robe in between the bells. And they symbolized fruitfulness, uh, abundant seeds. If you've ever seen a pomegranate and cut it in half, I mean, it's all seeds, right? So the idea was uh, uh, the fruitfulness or the abundance of God's word as a sweet and pleasant food and seeds that you know, would multiply. Uh, Exodus 39, 24, the tunic, a basic linen tunic was worn as an undergarment, Leviticus 8, 6 and 9. And if you notice in the picture, the high priest was barefoot. He wore no shoes when entering the holy place because it was considered holy ground. And so when the author speaks of the high priest, this is the grand image that his readers have of this person, his exalted position and his ministry. So when they're talking about the high priest, the Jews were talking about the high priest, the Jewish Christians were talking about the high priesthood, it was something magnificent, it was something beautiful, it was something uh, that, was, um, you know, that was expensive to produce. It was a one-of-a-kind thing, no other religion had this. So you know, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're a, if you're a Jewish Christian living in the first century, 
I mean, you're hunted by the Romans, you're rejected by your own culture, the Jews. You're meeting where? Underground, in rented places, in homes? You know, this is your, and, and, and your Lord is a, a, a criminal executed by pagans. And compared to that, you have this high priest <laughs> in all of his splendor, in the temple, in the parades, and all of the, the worship, and the history, and the culture. So there was a great temptation to return to this. All right, so let's keep going. Chapter five, he says, uh, in chapter five, one to four, so he says, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins, as for the people, um, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So after reviewing the history and the work of the Aaronic priesthood, he notes that they were not all selected on the basis of merit, but rather by the will of God. He also reminds them that even the priests had to, in the course of their temple service, they had to offer sacrifice for themselves first before they could do it for the people. Why? Because they were sinners too, okay? Just like the people that they represented. The idea was that this was a way to understand and sympathize with the people they served. In other words, when the priest or the high priest offered a sacrifice for himself before offering it on behalf of the people, he was showing the people that he too was a sinner. He also needed the sacrifice. So the priesthood was something uh, that the author is showing here that may have been exalted and beautiful to behold, but it was weak because it was manned by weak men who were appointed by God. Okay, so the last thing that he says is this. He says, well, Jesus is also a high priest. Now the author's already stated this, but in these verses, he's going to show that Jesus has better qualifications to be the high priest than Aaron and his descendants. And he mentions two things. Number one, he says, Jesus was appointed. Because the argument from the Jews, the Jews would be, well, who appointed him? Who made him priest? See what I'm saying? You know, we know that Aaron was appointed. We could read it in the Old Testament. You know? So Jesus also was appointed, verse five and six, he says, so also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you, just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So just as Aaron was appointed by God, the author says, so was Jesus. He proves his point by quoting two Old Testament scriptures that speak of the Messiah or the Son of God and his position, Psalm 2 verse 7 and Psalm 110 verse 4. Now the idea is that the Messiah was to be a priest forever, appointed by God along the lines of an Old Testament priest, not according to Aaron, but an Old Testament priest called Melchizedek. So remember what he's saying, hey, Jesus was also appointed and he's also a high priest, but not like Aaron. He's a high priest like Melchizedek. In other words, Jesus traces his priestly lineage back to Melchizedek, not back to Aaron. And remember, if you, if you remember what we talked about, Melchizedek appeared in history before Aaron appeared. Because Melchizedek Right, received tithes from Abraham. And before you get to Aaron, you have to have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, Levi, you see what I'm saying? Moses, Aaron, Aaron and his son. So you know, Melchizedek is back here somewhere in history and Aaron is over here. So the writer is saying, Jesus is appointed by God, but he traces his lineage all the way back to Melchizedek, not, not, not to not to Aaron. 
So now he doesn't, right at this point, he doesn't explain who this Melchizedek is right away. He assumes his audience are familiar with the term or the name. He merely establishes Christ's appointment as high priest and his lineage. Now, the author knew that for Jews, another stumbling block to accepting Jesus as a high priestly mediator was that he was descended through his earthly father, Joseph, and Joseph came through the line of Judah, not Levi. So this is why he's making this argument here, to, to kind of answer that, that argument. Now he's going to explain the, signif the significance of Melchizedek a little bit later on. For now, he simply traces the lineage. All right, so the first thing he says is he's appointed. The next thing he says is he is qualified for what? Well, to be the high priest. So let's read verses seven to 10. He says, in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So in order to qualify as a high priest, you needed to be appointed by God so as to have a right to stand before him and you needed to be able to relate to those whom you represented. Now Aaron qualified in both respects because he was appointed through Moses and he was a human being. The author here shows that in addition to his divine appointment, Jesus qualified as one who knew the sufferings of men because he also suffered and he suffered greatly. So he says in verses seven, eight, nine, first of all, that Jesus suffered anguish in the garden before his death, and like all men, he prayed to God with tears to help him uh, in his hour of trial. In verse eight, he talks about the idea that he suffered the restrictions of human nature, and he did only what the Father instructed. In this way, he demonstrated that he knew how to obey. And then in verse nine, the suggestion made is that he was, never, um, uh, he was never morally imperfect, but his human nature was brought totally in submission to God's will, even to the point of death. This is the kind of perfection and maturity that, uh, uh, that was revealed, or, uh, that he had, which the author is alluding to. So yes, Aaron is human, well, you know, Christ is human. Aaron is appointed, well, Christ is appointed. Aaron can relate to human uh, sin and human suffering, well, Christ can relate to human sin because he was tested and suffering because he suffered on the cross. So, you know, in both ways, in all ways, Christ and Aaron uh, are the same in this way. So Jesus qualified as a priest because he was appointed by God to serve in this way and also he, like Aaron, knew well the sufferings and limitations of the human condition. Now the author makes his point for this section, verses nine and 10, because Jesus is qualified in this way, he's able to perform the priestly duties which will result not only in the temporary helping of the people, which this is what Aaron did, you know, time after time, year after year, he was helping the people, you know, making a lot of sacrifices. The author is saying here, Jesus on the other hand, is able to give them an eternal and a complete salvation, not over and over again every year repeating the same sacrifices. So the author reiterates the idea of Melchizedek here as a kind of a bookend. He mentioned Melchizedek at the beginning and he mentions Melchizedek, see here in verse 10, at the very end to round out his opening remarks that revolved around the mysterious character called Melchizedek. And uh, next time, next lesson, we're going to go a little more deeper into this as uh, the author explains who Melchizedek was and why he's significant. All right, so let's make a summary, shall we? First of all, the author encourages them to strive for their hope of rest in heaven, reassured by the fact that their Lord Jesus is already there appealing to God on their behalf as high priest. Number two, 
Number two, he explains the original qualifications for high priest as regards Aaron, the original high priest of, of Israel. Aaron was appointed, Aaron could sympathize with the people. Number three, he shows them that Jesus is also qualified to be high priest because as Messiah, he was appointed by God to this office, but according to an eternal lineage referred to as the lineage of Melchizedek, not the temporary lineage of Aaron. And as one who took on a human nature, Jesus can also relate to the sufferings of the people that he ministers to. So his conclusion is that by virtue of his qualifications, Christians can have confidence for eternal life as it is ministered by their high priest, Jesus Christ. By implication, the author is saying that the priesthood of Aaron has been replaced by a greater and more effective priesthood of Jesus. And a little bit further on, we're going to cover this next time, he's going to explain how and why this happens. All right, so although not fully explained yet, the author, of course the author of Hebrews, the Holy Spirit, the author reassures Christians not only in the first century, but in every century, that they have someone already in heaven who is pleading their case at the throne of God. So when we pray, and, and this is some practical you know, application here for this lesson, the lesson tonight you know, is really a setup, it's a background. He hasn't made like, a lot of points on this yet. So we, we have to understand, well, who's Melchizedek and what's the argument? So that's, that, you know, tonight I've kind of been building the case here. But even at this preliminary part, there's still some lessons for us that are practical. And the first one is pray with this idea in mind. We're not just talking to ourselves when we pray. We're not just talking to the ceiling. We're not just closing our eyes and imagining something. The author here is saying, when we're praying, the person we're praying to is Jesus Christ, the high priest, who is in the heavenly realm, the place that we are eventually going to go to. So our prayers are uh, concrete. They have meaning. They, they are received by a very real person who has a very real purpose in our lives, okay? Another thing that this spiritual reality means, we mustn't put off dealing with sin because our high priest is in heaven pleading on our behalf. In other words, how can I simplify it? Let's not worry that, that our high priest can't handle our sins. I've had people say to me, believe it or not, they've said to me, Oh, I don't think I can become a Christian. I've just been too bad. I think anybody that's ever done any Bible study with someone may have heard that. I'm just too, I'm too bad. You know, God cannot, I've just done stuff that's so evil, so bad. And the writer here is saying, don't let that be the thing, you know, that, that incorrect idea that your sins are so bad. He's saying our high priest, he can handle anything anything, and our sins will be dealt with effectively. The, the thing we need to be careful is to avoid and put off and delay actually dealing with it. There's a great freedom that comes when we finally cough it up and say, Lord, you know what? I'm just not a very honest person. <laughs> uh, I've noticed that about me. I, I'm, I'm just not honest. Or Lord, I'm, I'm not sexually pure. I, I may look pure on the outside, but inside all kinds of cravings and all kinds of things, and I do things in secret, whatever it is, you know, or I gamble, or I, whatever. You know? We think, oh, it's just too yucky, too evil. We've done it too many times that the Lord is, is not going to deal with it. And uh, the writer here is assuring us that our high priest will take care of every sin. Do not allow that type of fear to hold you back. And then perhaps one more thing. We need to approach God with confidence. We should always approach Him with confidence in all matters because we have been assured that we will find grace and mercy there, not condemnation. 
There, there are not going to be any surprises waiting for us. I, I feel actually very badly for people who are uh, in a Muslim faith, for example, because they're never actually sure what Allah is going to do. That's why they say, well, if Allah wills, I've done everything I'm supposed to do, I've gone on pilgrimage, I've, the, you know, I've kept the fast, the Ramadan, I've done all that good stuff, I've tried to be a good Muslim all my life, but you know, at the last minute, maybe I won't, maybe I won't make it. You know, this is why um, religious fanaticism that sees itself in suicide bombings is so popular among the young. Why? Because it's the one way that they can be assured that they will be in paradise if they die for their faith, if they're martyrs for their faith. Well, that's not the case with us. <laughs> we don't have to be martyrs to be assured of, of heaven. God is telling us, I'm assuring you of heaven. I swear to you by my own name, I swear to you that if you have faith in my son, you will, you will be in heaven. So there won't be any surprises. What you want, what you've asked for, what you've prayed for, and what you've been promised is exactly what you and I will receive. No, no surprises. I think the surprise will be how wonderful, how really wonderful it will be, maybe. We're not used to seeing how wonderful things are, but no surprises. We know exactly where we're going and we know exactly why we're going there, okay? All right, so that'll be it for this time. Again, a lot of setup stuff. We're really going to hit the meat of the matter uh, in the next couple of weeks. All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.